more deaths than theism in the 20th century. No, I, 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 I think this is good. I just wanted to say that I think that the, those commandments are injunctions to do evil, but I, I would much prefer to say that the tribe that thought it was hearing these instructions from God to kill all of its rivals, exterminate all its rivals for the Holy Land, might possibly have had, I think it, it, it's overwhelmingly probable it did have, the need to seek and claim divine approval for the war of greedy extermination, annexation, and racist conquest that it was going to undertake anyway. In other words, I don't think there was an authority issuing that commandment, whether it was morally good or otherwise, um, as a matter of the truth. But I would, I would add, it, and I think the concession is very well worth having, that there is absolutely no proof at all that Christianity makes people behave better. And wait a minute, I didn't concede that. When I said I wasn't going to argue that, because it's irrelevant, but by no means did I concede that. And, and I do appreciate as well the way you frame the issue about the, the Canaanites. I think you're quite right in saying that this is not an issue about whether or not God exists. Rather, this is a question about biblical inerrancy. Did these Israelites get it right in thinking that God had commanded them to do these things, or did they in their nationalistic fervor think uh, God is on our side and do something which in fact they weren't commanded to do by God. So that this isn't a, an issue between atheism and theism, this is an issue about biblical inspiration and inerrancy, and that's an important issue, but me, it's friend. not one that is on the floor tonight. Our next student question. Hi, uh, my question is mainly directed at Mr. Hitchens, but Christian theism, as with all theisms that claim a revelation, say that the purpose of human existence is to serve God, and uh, Mr. Or Dr. Craig might want to expound on that in some way, but Mr. Hitchens, as an atheist with no transcendent being giving you a reason for existence, what then is the best way to live life, or what is motivation for living life, or what is the purpose of your existence without a transcendent being telling you what to do? Well, I find, I find it, you see, this is where I find it hard to accept the grammar of your question. It's as if if I was only willing to concede it uh, supernatural, you, you want to say transcendent, um, I want to say supernatural, then my life would have purpose. I, I think that's a too, complete non sequitur. To me, at any rate, I'll have to just make the confession. And this is as, as real to me, subjectively, as any William Jamesian apprehension of the divine. I, I, don't, I don't get your point at all. Uh, Dr. Craig, one of the written questions says, and I think it is consistent with the question from the audience, you have written that life without God is absurd, How? but I know unbelievers who are living fulfilling moral lives. In what way is their life absurd? Okay, let me respond to that and to the question here that was asked. I would say that the purpose of life for which God has created us is not to serve God. Remember, Jesus said, I have not called you servants, I have called you friends. And I think the Westminster Confession gets it right when it says the purpose of human existence is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. God is the fulfillment of human existence. It is in fellowship eternally with God, the source of infinite goodness and love, that the true fulfillment of human existence and, and freedom is to be found. Now, when I say that apart from theism, life is, a, is meaningless, I mean objective. Meaningless. This is the same distinction that we're talking about with regard to moral values. I'm saying that on atheism, there is no objective purpose for human existence. As Mr. Hitchens recognizes, eventually the universe will grow cold, dilute, dark, and dead as it runs down toward maximum entropy and, and heat death and all human existence and 
uh, life will be extinguished uh, on an atheistic view of the future of the universe. There is no purpose for which the universe exists. The litter of a dead universe will just expand into the endless darkness forever, a universe in ruins. Now, of course, one can still live one's life as an illusion, thinking, oh, well, the purpose of life is to, say, uh, hit 40 home runs and steal 40 bases every year, you know, in the major leagues, and, and you draw the meaning of your existence from that. But that's not really the meaning of your existence. It's just a subjective illusion. In fact, your existence on atheism is objectively meaningless. So that's, that's the distinction that I was making. Again, it's between objective and mere subjective illusion. Well, um, I think that's wow. exactly the, the wrong way around. See, as I was beginning to say earlier, we didn't have time in the question period. I wouldn't say that atheism was morally inferior. I wouldn't concede that for a second. I don't want to make a claim for its superiority either, but there may be a slight edge here. We don't believe anything that could be called wishful. In other words, we don't particularly welcome the idea of the annihilation either of ourselves as individuals, the, the party will go on and will have left and we're not coming back. Or, or the uh, entrop entropic heat death of the universe. We don't like the idea. But there's a good deal of evidence to suggest that that is what's going to happen. And there's very, very little evidence to suggest that I'll see you all again in some theme park. One nice and one nasty. I there's absolutely no evidence for that at all. So I'm willing to accept on the evidence Conclusions that may be unwelcome to me. I'm sorry if I sound as if I'm spelling that out, but I will. Now, you want to know what makes my life meaningful, generally speaking, it's been struggling myself to be free, and if I can say it without immodesty, Mr. Hill finally said it for me, too flatteringly uh, beforehand, um, but trying to help others to be free too. Um, that's what's given a lot of meaning to my life and, and does still, the solidarity with those, those who want to be as free as I am, by, partly by luck and partly by my own, own efforts and efforts of others. Well, one obstacle to liberty, and that's why I mentioned precision, and gives so many examples of it in history and in the present day, is the poisonous role played by fellow primates of mine who think they can tell me what to do in the name of God because God's told them that they have this power. So that's one thing I'd like to be shot of right here in the here and now. And my suspicion is, if you really ask the religious, where do they want power? And what's the world they care about? The next one or this one? It'll be this one every time, because they too know perfectly well that this is the only life we've got. Yeah, I don't think that's true. It seems to me that um, uh, on the basis of the resurrection of Jesus that we have grounds, for the hope of immortality. This is the, the foundation upon which the Christian hope is predicated. So again, it gets back to whether or not one has good grounds for thinking that Jesus was who he claimed to be and that God raised him from the dead. Because if he did, then there is hope of immortality. I, I return your, your question to me, I return it to you in a, in a different form. If there's going to be a, a resurrection an ingathering, if in the end all injustices will be cancelled, uh, all tears dried, all the other promises kept, then why do you care what happens in this brief veil of tears? Why do the churches want power in the here and now? Why do they want to legislate for things like abortion or sexuality or morality? Why, why bother? I mean, isn't it, isn't it just as much the case, as Dostoevsky says about atheism, that um, without God all things are possible, that with God all things are thinkable too? Not at all. It, as Dostoevsky said, if, if there is no immortality, all things are permitted, he said, because it all ends up the same, it all comes out in the water. But if there is a God who exists, who loves human beings and has created them in his image and endowed them with intrinsic moral value and unalienable rights, then you have every reason to treasure other persons as ends in themselves. And the desire of pro-life uh, persons to champion the lives of the unborn or the lives of the dying isn't a, a power grab, Mr. Hitchens. It's because they genuinely care about the lives of innocent human beings that they believe are being wantonly destroyed. So it, it's a very positive motivation.
Oh, agreed, agreed, but there are perfectly good, there are perfectly good humanist motives for doing all those things, and if you want to have a reason for caring about the survival and health and well-being of others, the idea that you might depend on them for the only life you've got, and, and they, they on you for solidarity, is just as good an explanation for right action. No, no, by, by the, by, by, per contra, if, given, if people think God is telling them what to do, or they have God on their side, what will they not do? That's what I meant by the reverse of the Dostoevsky question. What crime will not be committed? What offense to justice and to reason and to humanity will not be, is not regularly committed by people who are convinced that it is God's will that they do that? If they it's commit such God atrocities, it is only because they act inconsistently with their worldview rather than in line with it. Jesus would not have been uh, a guard at Auschwitz or uh, someone who would uh, take away the, the human rights of another person. You, you, need to ask what kinds of actions are sanctioned by a worldview. And on atheism, as, as Dr. Kodesky said, it seems everything is permitted. Humanism without God as a basis for humanism is just a form of speciesism, a bias in favor of your own species. I, I think Christianity firm, affirms the real basis for humanism. Auschwitz is the outcome of centuries in which the Christian church uh, Announced, believed that the Jewish people that had called for the blood of Jesus of Nazareth to be on their head uh, for every generation. It's only in one verse of the Bible, I know, but it happens to be the verse the church picked up on. I don't say Jesus would have been a guard there, that's not the point. The point is that this is not an aberration of religion, it's, it is a scriptural injunction, as is the one to kill the United States, as, is the, one to, as is the one to mutilate the, the genitals of children. The, it is, the issue is, would Jesus have been a guard at Auschwitz? Because insofar as people who claim to be his followers were guards at Auschwitz, they were acting inconsistently and in defiance of the ethic of Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you should tell that to the Vatican. I mean, we know uh, Paul Johnson in his very um, uh, friendly uh, history of Christianity uh, says that uh, uh, up to 50 to 60 percent of the Waffen SS were practicing confessing Catholics in good standing. No one was ever threatened with, with discipline by the church with excommunication, for example, for taking part in the final solution. The only Nazi ever excommunicated by the, by the church was Joseph Goebbels. And if you like, I'll tell you now. To the student. His wife was a divorced Protestant. Excuse me, anyway. excuse me, Christianity does have some standards. Next student. Uh, I'd just like to thank both of you guys for being here. And in the interest of fairness, I know I'm playing devil's advocate here, pun intended, but um, I think since almost all of the questions are going to be directed towards uh, uh, the Mr. Hitchens, I think we, uh, we should have one for Dr. Craig. They're all for both of us. <laughs> um, for Dr. Craig, what do you think about uh, Epicurus' argument that if God is omnibelevant, omniscient, and omnipotent, if he knows about kids in Africa and he, uh, like, that are born with like AIDS, um, what do you think about him suggesting, like him not intervening and him not changing uh -huh. that fact? Like, I don't, I, like, that's a question that I've always uh, struggled with, so I'm just wondering, yeah. uh, like, could you expand on that and I'd also like your yeah. input on it? The problem of evil and suffering has been greatly discussed by philosophers, and I think there's been genuine progress made uh, in this century on this problem. I think it's important to distinguish between the intellectual problem of suffering and the emotional problem of suffering. Uh, because these are quite different from each other. In terms of the intellectual problem of suffering, I think that there you need to ask yourself, is the atheist claiming, as Epicurus did, that the existence of God is logically incompatible with the evil and suffering in the world? If that's what the atheist is claiming, then he's got to be presupposing some kind of hidden assumptions that would bring out that contradiction and make it explicit, because these statements are not explicitly contradictory. The problem is no philosopher in the history of the world has ever been able to identify what those hidden assumptions would be that would bring out the contradiction and make it explicit. On the contrary, you can actually prove that these are logically compatible with each other by adding a third proposition, namely, that God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil in the world. As long as that statement is even possibly true, it proves that there's no logical incompatibility between God and the suffering in the world. So the atheist would have to show that it is logically impossible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world. 
and no atheist has ever been able to do that. So the, the logical version of this problem, I think, is widely recognized to have failed. Those atheists who still press the problem, therefore press it as a probabilistic argument. They try to say that given the evil in the world, it's improbable that God exists. Not impossible, but improbable. Well, again, the difficulty there is that the atheist has to claim that if God did exist, then it is improbable that he would permit the evil and suffering in the world. And how could the atheist possibly know that? How could the atheist know that uh, God would not, if he existed, permit the evil and suffering in the world? Maybe he's got good reasons for it. Uh, maybe, like in Christian theism, God's purpose for human history is to bring the maximum number of people freely into his kingdom to find salvation and eternal life. And how do we know that that wouldn't require a world that is simply suffused with natural and moral suffering? It might be that only in a world like that the maximal number of people would freely come to know God and find salvation. So the atheist would have to show that there is a possible world that's feasible for God, which God could have created that would have just as much salvation and eternal life and knowledge of God as the actual world, but with less suffering. And how could the atheist prove such a thing? It's sheer speculation. So the problem is that as an argument, the problem of evil it makes probability judgments which are very, very ambitious and which we are simply not in a position to make with any kind of confidence. Now, I recognize that that philosophical response to the question doesn't deal with the emotional problem of evil. And I think for most people, this isn't really a philosophical problem. It's an emotional problem. They just don't like a God who would permit suffering uh, and, and uh, pain in the world. And so they turn their backs on him. What does Christianity have to say to this problem? Well, I think it has a lot to say. It tells us that God is not some sort of an impersonal ground of being or an indifferent tyrant who folds his arms and watch, watches the world suffer. Rather, he is a God who enters into human history in the person of Jesus Christ. And what does he do? He suffers. On the cross, Christ bore a suffering of which we can form no conception. Even though he was innocent, he bore the penalty of the sins of the whole world. None of us can comprehend what he suffered. And I think when we contemplate the cross of Christ and his love for us and what he was willing to undergo for us, it puts the problem of suffering in an entirely different perspective. It means, I think, that we can bear the suffering that God calls upon us to endure in this life with courage and with optimism for an eternal life of unending joy beyond the grave because of what Christ has done for us. And he will give us, I think, the courage and the, the strength to get through the suffering that God calls upon us to bear in this life. So whether it's an emotional issue or an intellectual issue, I think ultimately uh, Christian theism can make sense out of the, the suffering and evil in the world. As the clock winds down, I reserve yeah. the last um, question for I'm myself, not, Mr. Hitchcock. Uh, just on the devil's advocate point, when the Vatican asked me to testify against Mother Teresa, I discovered, which I did, I discovered that the office of devil's advocate has been abolished. Um, so I, I come before you as the only person ever to have represented the devil pro bono. Last question. Yeah, now, the, 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 I, I'm not one of the, I, I, I was very intrigued by that reply, and I largely agree with this. If I, if I was a believer, I would not feel God owed me an explanation. I'm not one of those atheists who thinks you can go around saying, complaining. I mean, if you make the assumption that there is a deity, then all things are possible. You just have to be able to make that assumption. Um, at our debate in Dallas the other day, I, I mentioned the case of Frau, Fraulein uh, Freisel, the Austrian woman who was in, imprisoned in a dungeon by her father for a quarter of a century and, and incestuously raped and tortured and kept in the dark with her children for 25 years. And I thought, I asked people to imagine how she must have beseeched him, how she must have begged him, and how the children must have, and how they must have prayed, and how, how those prayers went unanswered, and those beggings and beseechments went unanswered for 25 years. And um, Douglas Wilson's reply to me was, God will cancel all that, um, and all those tears will be dried. And I say, well, if, you, if, you, if you're capable of believing that, then obviously what that woman went through and her children went through 
was perfectly worthwhile. And her father was all that time, without knowing it, and apparently not uh, particularly wishing it, um, an instrument of the divine will. And as I have said to you before this evening, had occasion to say, you're perfectly free to believe that if you wish. To conclude. I do. You could, um, Mr. Hitchens, you've got 4,000 people here, tens of thousands more watching. You could do the same exchange at Wheaton, at Westmont, at Azusa Pacific, at Point Loma, at Notre Dame, at every great Christian university in the United States. Why do you think so many people come out to see debates with accomplished people like Dr. Craig and you? It's a time uh, for this great question to come up again. Um, I think there are two reasons for it. Um, one is the um, emergence of a very aggressive theocratic challenge in various parts of the world. Um, we are about to see a, a, long, a, a long feared nightmare come true, the acquisition of apocalyptic weaponry by a messianic regime in, in Tehran. Uh, which is al already enslaving and ruining a, a formerly great civilization. Um, we see the forces of Al-Qaeda and related jihadists ruining the societies um, of Iraq, of Afghanistan, Pakistan. Uh, we see uh, Jewish settlers stealing other people's land in the name of God in the hope that this will bring on a messianic combat and uh, the return of the Messiah. Um, and even in our own country, we're not free from people who want to have stultifying nonsense taught to children in school and in science class. So there's, there's that. It's in the news all the time. And then there's the existence of a very small group of which I'm very proud to be a part that says it's time to take a stand against theocratic uh, bullying and is willing to go anywhere to debate these matters and put these great questions to the proof. So and thank you for giving me the chance. I would... I would answer the question somewhat differently. I think that what we're seeing is the fruit of modernity. Uh, in the Enlightenment, the church and the monarchy were thrown off in the name of free thought and unshackled uh, human inquiry. And the thought was that once mankind was freed from the shackles and bondage of religion, that this would produce uh, a sort of uh, humanistic utopia. And instead, I think what we've come to see is that the fruit of the naturalistic worldview is that mankind is reduced to uh, meaninglessness, valuelessness, and purposelessness. And that therefore the question of God's existence has become all the more poignant in our age because we're, we're beginning to question, I think, the fruit of modernity and questioning scientific naturalism. I'm privileged to be part of a revolution in Christian philosophy that has been going on over the last half century that has literally transformed the face of Anglo-American philosophy. As the scientific, naturalistic, atheistic worldview has been challenged in the name of, of reason and philosophy, and the theistic worldview um, reasserted. Uh, and I believe that we're seeing a tremendous groundswell of interest among lay people as this revolution is beginning to filter down to the man in the street. So I would see us as, as beginning to question the assumptions of modernity and the bitter fruits of modernity that have uh, been so evident in the 20th century. And, and I'm hoping that this will lead to uh, a tremendous renaissance in Christian thinking and Christian faith. To wrap up then, Five quick observations and some instructions. Number one, no good society prohibits debates such as this one. Number two, only confident faith welcomes them. Only extraordinary universities stage them. And only, only very accomplished scholars and intellectuals can make them interesting and entertaining. Please join me in welcoming and thanking our panelists.
both men. Both men. They did agree on one thing, which is that N.T. Wright is a very impressive man, I think Christopher Hitchens said. And therefore, to the viewing audience who might not know who N.T. Wright is, I recommend on Mr. Hitchens' strong recommendation that you get and read his books. I also want to tell you that I'm going to ask you to stay in your seats as our panelists exit stage right. There's a book signing. And I want to ask you if you have a book to stand in line. If you don't, please don't. And to recognize Mr. Hitchens has a 5 o'clock flight in the morning. So get your book signed. He loves to do that. But please don't ask him about his third cousin that you yeah. once met in Melbourne. Is, Just yeah. let them get to talk to the book. So gentlemen, I'm going to let you stage, enter stage left here, and I'll hold them for a second. Thank you very much. Stay there so they can get around back. I want to thank Dr. Craig Hazen, Tory Honors Institute, and everyone at Biola for coming this evening. Have a safe, productive trip home. Good night. Bye. Dean Timothy Halsey of the Honors College, who will be moderating this event, and founder of How many of you are here tonight? How many do not respond to surveys? Three out of ten don't respond to surveys, Dean. This is my first formal debate. So uh, give me a little grace if I can't cram everything I want to say into 20 minutes. I will say, however, I've had many informal debates, most of them with my wife, and I have not fared very well there. I will say, however, that she is probably the perfect sparring partner for Christopher Hitchens because her nickname at our house is Nails. And uh, Nails is the type of woman that, if she ain't happy, ain't nobody in the house happy. So hopefully I'm prepared for a very formidable opponent in Christopher Hitchens. And I do wanna say that I very much like Christopher Hitchens. I've been following him for many years. I'm kind of a political junkie, so I've seen him around quite a bit. And I appreciate his charm and his wit, and I agree with him on a lot of things. Obviously, not the issue of God. That would make a very boring debate. But I will say that um, I went up to Christopher just about a half hour ago, and I shook his hand, and I said, Christopher, I'm actually a fan. And he smiled, and he said, the night is young. <laughs> <laughs> I want to... <laughs> I want to thank the United Secular Alliance. I want to thank uh, Daniel Pendergrass. Where's Daniel? Are you here, Daniel? Uh, he was my contact here. I also want to thank uh, Dean Tim Timothy Halsley, and I also want to thank, of course, Christopher uh, for doing this debate. I think it's impossible not to like Christopher. Uh, and as I mentioned, I do. He's carrying the cross for atheism, and he carries it very well. Tonight, I'm going to carry the cross for theism. And I want to point out that I think we're both trying to explain the world around us. We both have the burden of proof to explain why reality is the way it is. I have to show how reality is best explained by theism, and Christopher has to explain how reality is best explained by atheism. And I think we should follow the evidence where it leads. I think that the evidence we see all around us and within us leads to a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, personal, powerful, intelligent, moral creator, i.e. what we would call a theistic God. And this creator created this universe and the life within us, or the life within it, I should say. Now, I'm going to try and summarize uh, my 450-page uh, book, at least the first 200 pages of it, in the next 20 minutes or next 18 minutes at this point now. and that is an impossible task. That would be about uh, 20 pages a minute. Actually, I probably can do it because I'm originally from New Jersey. See, I speak at 150 words a minute with gusts to 350. So if uh, I go a little quick and you want to see more of the evidence, please get the book. I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. And I want to point out that all the proceeds from the sale of the book will go to feed needy children. Mine, okay? <laughs> See, I've got three sons. The oldest two are in college right now, so I need a little help, and one of them is sitting right over here. Wrong in... Um, I'm, a, in a small way, a biographer of uh, Thomas Jefferson, and his uh, memorial, as you know, 
omitted the mention of his presidencies and vice presidencies and preferred to focus on his work at the university and his authorship of the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, which is the embryo and basis of the First Amendment to our Constitution, which makes this the only country in the world that has ever decided that God and constitutional matters should be separated. And it's in defense partly of that civilizational impulse uh, that I rise this evening uh, to satirize the idea that we're here by somebody else's permission and owe that person an explanation, which is what it is to be a theist, if not a deist at any rate. Um, I almost never watch television, and I'm, I'm, I'm usually glad that I don't, but now I'm glad that I sometimes I'm forced by my daughter to watch Family Guy. <laughs> because you may possibly have seen the moment when the chubby father comes down in the morning and looks at his cereal in the bowl, accepting your, some, one of your more sophisticated challenges. So. Um, and he says, <laughs> says woo, 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 woo. And his daughter says, those are Cheerios, Dan. <laughs> but I accept the ontological challenge. And I accept it in this way. The answer to the question which with, with which we confront ourselves tonight, or are confronted if you prefer, does God exist, is to me, yes, it does. It must do. It must do because it is so real to those who do believe in it. There are people of whom it may be said that for them, God does exist. I've become perfectly persuaded of this by now. There is no form of persuasion that would make me assent to this proposition. Some of us are born. We are born too. Uh, in answer to Blaise Pascal's own problem, the one that made him write his pensée and address them to those who are so made that they cannot believe. But those of us to whom almost everything that Dr. Troik just said would be the mere equivalent of white noise. I suppose it's my job this evening to explain ontologically how that is the case. Perhaps I'll do it by force of example. Recently, very recently, in fact, as, as little uh, uh, ago in time as last year, the uh, Vatican announced that limbo, the destination of the un unbaptized child soul, no longer exists. There is no such place. Um, St. Augustine was in error, it appears, in sending so many children, at least the souls of so many unbaptized children, to this destination for so long. Among the... Um, comments that I heard about this, among the mildest, actually, was that of a woman raised in the Catholic faith, whose child had died before baptism could take place, who had for many years believed that that's where her unbaptized child had gone. And she said, they can't tell me that place doesn't exist. It's been as real to me as anything possibly could be. They've no right to tell me now that this no longer is Ontologically, Limbo exists for those who believe in it just as God does. I'm not here to deny that. It's only a few decades now since the rival church, Church of Rome, uh, the Church of England announced that really no one actually goes to hell. It could be that after you die you're forbidden God's grace, but there's no real place of eternal, unending, infinite torture and torment with which those who claim the grace of God and the redemption of Jesus made a living for so many years. How do they make their living? By lying to children. Think of it. Hundreds and hundreds of years of people proudly earning their keep by lying to children and terrifying them and saying that because they could do that, they were morally superior to us. Reason, common sense, decency, ordinary decency rebels against this kind of mind-forged manacle however charmingly or humorously it's expressed. But hell exists in the minds of several people I've spoken to just today on this campus in the, in the intervals of, uh, of other conversations. Uh, the, for them, it's real, and I don't say that it's not. But what I want to show is that it can, if it does exist, nonetheless be abolished, like many other mind-forged manacles and man-made tyrannies that confront us. And in fact, that this belief in a supreme and unalterable tyranny is the oldest enemy of our species, the oldest enemy of our intellectual freedom and our moral autonomy, and must be met, and must be challenged, and must be overthrown. I want to argue for nothing less than that. 
It's actually rather wonderful, isn't it? The uh, religious authorities who used to say they were infallible say, just take the last pope, just the last. I know I'm not talking with the Catholic apologist this evening, but nonetheless, the church, when people say the church, they know which one they mean. They mean the one in Rome. The one where when Stephen Hawking was invited and was asked at the conference on the church and science, is there anything he'd like to see in Rome while he was there? He said he'd like to see the records of the trial of Galileo. Um, don't please be invoking Mr. Hawking, by the way, as if he was a deist. Um, the last pope, just in the last decade of his tenure, apologized. He said, we were wrong about the Jewish question. We probably shouldn't have said for so long the Jews were responsible for the murder of Christ. We were probably wrong in forced conversion of the peoples of the, the Indies, as they were called, the, the Isthmus and the southern cone of our hemisphere. We were certainly wrong. We owe an apology to the Muslims for the atrocities of the Crusades. We owe an apology to the Eastern Orthodox uh, churches uh, for the uh, incredible butchery to which they, our fellow Christians, were subjected by us, the Roman Catholic Church. And we probably owe an apology to the Protestants for saying and so many awful things about them and torturing and burning and killing them too. So having now said we were completely wrong and completely cruel and completely sadistic and completely violent and retarded human civilization for that many centuries in that many countries and continents, we're quit. And now we can go back to being infallible all over again. There are, the, there are people who on faith will accept being spoken to in that tone of voice and in that way. But I, ladies and gentlemen, am not one of them. And I don't think there's any form of persuasion that should allow you to be spoken to as if you were serfs or slaves either. Proceeding with the ontology with which I began, the Aquinas point, that if, if you can conceive of something, whether it's a ghost, uh, a phantasm, uh, or a deity, if you can conceive of something, it is in some sense real if it's real in your mind. Uh, and showing with the obvious fallacy that has always attended that, is it nonetheless possible for an atheist to say, a proclaimed atheist to say, as I do, um, proclaim myself to be, that God positively can be said not to exist? No. It's a very common misunderstanding about my fraternity sorority. I'll just take a moment to clear it up. The atheist says, no persuasive argument for the existence of God has ever been advanced or adduced without convincing rebuttal. That no argument in favor stands or has been found to stand the test of argument and evidence. We cannot say that we know that there could be no such entity. Among other things, we are too reverent of the extraordinary time of discovery, <coughs> innovation, pushing back of the frontiers of knowledge and, and understanding that's taken place just in our own time to make any such remark. But by saying this, we say, I think, quite a lot. There is no valid or coherent or consistent argument that would not work if it comes to that for the existence of any god. Now, I notice it was a, by a slight work of illusion, a bit of uh, tap dancing there, that Dr. Turek went from uh, being a deist to a theist, and then from being a theist to a Christian. Now, I know he does not believe in the existence of the sun god Ra. I'm practically certain he doesn't believe in the existence of Zeus. If you'll pick up a copy of my Portable Atheist, a selection of the finest writings by non-believers uh, down the years, and just turn to the three pages where Mencken, H.L. Mencken, lists the easiest to name 3,000 gods that used to be worshipped and that no longer are held to exist by anybody, uh, you'll spare me the trouble of reading them out. Um, no, he thinks he do doesn't just know Dr. that there is a god, he knows which one is the right one from a potentially infinite list, actually from a list that's as long as the number of people there are or have ever been in the human species, because if you ever argue with a theist or a deist, as I do every day, you'll find they all believe in a god of their very own. Indeed, they often say a personal god. Indeed, they often say a personal savior. So out of, out of what are we reifying a concept that applies to all of us? Out of nothing but wish thinking and nonsense and fear and ignorance and above all, and I'm not quitting on this point, servility. Everyone in this room is an atheist. Everyone can name a god in which they do not believe. Let them advance the case that the one in which they believe is the superior one. Let Dr. Torek be the first person I've ever met to do that convincingly this evening.
and I will show him due respect. I don't think the task can actually be undertaken. Now, the same tap dancing, hopes you will not notice that deism and theism are two quite different things. The deist argument says that there is so much order apparent in nature and in the cosmos and in the universe that it might be unwise to assume that such order has no one interested in ordering or design. That, that, that assumption might be, an, might be an unsafe. The philosopher Paley in his uh, natural theology said design implies a designer. He came up with the very famous image of the watch. You come across the watch if you're a primitive tribes person in the Sahara, you may not know what it's for, but you know that it's not a rock or a vegetable. You know it has purpose and someone made it that way. Um, until quite recently, that was the default position of most intelligent people, including Mr. Jefferson, who despite his intermittent atheism, in my judgment, was a deist. I'm so sorry, was a deist, was a deist. He would debate with um, among the many skills he had, is a very advanced to a level of paleontology. He would debate with the greatest paleontologist of his time, the Count of Buffon. How, how comes it, how can it be that we find seashells so high on the mountains of Virginia? How can this be? Not even the most intelligent people of that day, and it's very recent, it's an instant in historical time, had any idea how that could be. There isn't anyone in this room who wasn't educated and brought up knowing exactly how that is. It's just a shame that uh, Jefferson and many other intelligent and humane and uh, well-educated literate people just oh, couldn't Darwin. see that far. He wasn't to know, though Darwin was born in his day, on the same day, actually in 1809 as Abraham the Lincoln, the very same day, the two great emancipators, Darwin being, in my judgment, the greater of the two. But now we know, we know this proposition to be true, the proposition that was ridiculed so, uh, so uh, pathetically, I have to say, I thought, by Dr. Torek, there is no explanation for the origins of our species, for the origins of our cosmos, for the origins of our globe itself. There is not one explanation left which requires the existence of a deus ex machina. In every case, we have a better or sufficient explanation. I think that assertion of mine will stand any challenge this evening. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, some more of them. Of course, Darwin used creationist images. He actually set out uh, to um, vindicate uh, Paley's theology. He thought he could do it by his study, taxonomical study of nature. Um, Einstein used uh, God images when he spoke uh, of the extraordinary majesty of the cosmos. It's, it's, it's in us, it's in our vocabulary, it's hardwired in us, you might almost say, to use images of awe-inspiring, um, godly, uh, Mozartian, you might, you might say, or even Shakespearean images when talking about these things. But when we come down to the actual analysis of them, we find that we don't need the prime mover at all, and that most of the prime mover explanations, if not all of them, have been positively misleading, so that the deist may propose a designer, and I may not be able to show you convincingly that there could be no such person, but the theist has all their work still ahead of them. From this designer, how do we get to the designer who answers prayers? Did you hear a thing? I mean, just in this phrase, even an implication, even a suggestion from anything my opponent said, that you could, by an argument from design, prove answered prayers, or prove that someone born of a virgin was therefore the son of a god, or could prove that resurrections occur, and that by uh, people being tortured to death thousands of years ago, we are now redeemed, that we are vicariously forgiven our own offenses by human sacrifice. How does deism help you to that? It doesn't. It quite simply doesn't and can not. And the attempt to build from one to the other is a conjuring trick of a very vulgar, I think, kind. We live in the childhood of our species, so when Stephen Hawking says that if we could understand the event horizon that surrounds the black hole, we would in some sense know the mind of God, he proves that our vocabulary is still that of our infancy. He makes no concession to the idea of a theist or theocratic uh, dispensation. I'd better ask now how I'm doing for time. Good. I'm not sure I'm going to need all that. Um, 
but I like to try and reply and fight on my feet when I can. And I made some notes about, about what uh, Dr. Turek had said, and I feel that uh, they were challenges to me that I would be um, ignoble if I didn't uh, respond to. Um, the first, and I thought the most, frankly, the most egregious, was this. I find it extraordinary that it can be said on a university campus in this year of grace that, uh, that without God, humans are capable of doing anything. That there is no moral restraint upon us if we don't concur in the idea that we are the property and uh, creation of a supreme being. Uh, I'm making the assumption that all of you check in every now and then with some kind of news outlet and have a view of what's going on in the rest of the world. Isn't it as plain as could be that those who commit the most callous, the most cruel, the most brutal, the most indiscriminate atrocities of all do so precisely because they believe they have divine permission? Shall I answer my own question? Shall I insult you? by adding more, who can't think of an example of this kind? Let me put the question in another form that I've put in now. Uh, every forum from YouTube, to C-SPAN, to the wireless, to the print, to the radio, to the television, and in, in, innumerable forums to those who say that without God there can be no morality. You are to ask yourself two questions. You are to name a moral action undertaken, or a moral and ethical statement made by a believer I dare say you can do it. You are then to say that you can not imagine a non-believer making this moral statement or undertaking this moral action. Can you think, can you now think, can any of you think, you have, don't have to answer now, you have all night, and, and you have my email. <laughs> and I've done this with everyone from the Archbishop of Canterbury to Shut even lower down. people. Um, <laughs> You name me the ethical and moral actional statement that a believer can make and an unbeliever cannot, and there's a prize. And I'll tell you that about that later. Now there's a second question. Think of something wicked that only a believer would be likely to do, or something wicked that only a believer would be likely to say. You've already thought of it. The suicide bombing community is entirely religious. The genital mutilation community is entirely religious. I wouldn't say that the child abuse community is entirely religious, I wouldn't, but it's bidding to be entirely religious. It operates on the old Latin slogan, no child's behind left. <laughs> how dare anybody, how dare anyone who speaks for religion uh, say of us, the secular and the non-believers, that we are the immoral ones. It is itself a wicked thing to say, itself an absolutely indefensible thing to say. No. The decapitation on the bus is going to be done by someone who thinks God is telling him to do it. Smerdyakov is actually the stupidest character in Dostoevsky. He's the one who makes this proposition. Everyone has to understand, everyone has to understand that it is those who feel that the divine is prompting them, who feel they're permitted anything and everything. And it is those who are the leading, most salient, most violent, most vicious opponents of the values and civilization that Thomas Jefferson uh, stood for and promulgated. Uh, just on the question of fine-tuning, I have a number of responses. We have to postpone some of the, 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 the naturalistic questions for, for later, when I know they'll come up again. Um, you mentioned Edwin Hubble and the way that he saw the red light shift and uh, saw that the universe was not just expanding, but, the, the, but expanding very fast, away from itself, that the Big Bang had not stopped. Uh, Lawrence Krauss, great physicist, probably the next Nobel Prize winner, has uh, noticed that most of people's assumption was wrong. That though this expansion was taking place, it was thought, the rate of speed of expansion must surely be declining. People still think in Newtonian terms in this way. No, says Krauss, he's pointed it out and now it's agreed by all. No, the Hubble rate of red light shift is increasing. The universe is dissipating itself at high speed, and the speed is getting greater. What does this mean? Well, it answers the question of why is there something instead of nothing? Because now we have something. We're all here because there's something. And nothing is coming right for us. Very soon, the physicists wouldn't be able to tell the Big Bang had ever taken place. So far sprung apart. 
will the whole system be? And meanwhile, look in the sky at night, and you can see the Andromeda galaxy headed straight for ours on a direct collision course. Who designed that? Who made it certain that every other planet in our solar system is either too hot or too cold to support life, as is most of our own planet, and that in just one tiny, irrelevant solar system already condemned to heat death and implosion. Some design, wouldn't you say? But these are just the paltering minor objections that I have to the theistic worldview. The main one is the one with which I began. Religion, theism, not deism, theism I, un I underline. Theism says that all our manifold problems, what is the good, how shall we live it, how shall we know it, how to explain suffering, how to, how to confront the possibility of our own perhaps molecular irrelevance. This all these questions uh, that must disturb and detain us all can be solved by referring them upward to a totalitarian judgment, to an absolutist monarch. The other thing that the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom was supposed to uh, rebut, repudiate, disown. Yes, uh, I promise you, 30 seconds. Uh, there is no totalitarian solution. There is no big brother in the sky. It is a horrible idea that there is somebody who owns us, who makes us, who supervises us, waking and sleeping, who knows our thoughts, who can convict us of thought crime, who can do thought crime just for what we think, uh, who can judge us while we sleep for things that might occur to us in our dreams, who can create us sick, as apparently we are, and then order us on pain of eternal torture to be well again. Th to demand this, to wish this to be true, is to wish to live as an abject slave. It is a wonderful thing. It is a wonderful thing, in my submission, that we now have enough information, enough intelligence, and I hope, enough intellectual and moral courage to say that this ghastly proposition is founded on a lie and to celebrate that fact. And I invite you to join me in doing so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hitchens. We now have five minutes of rebuttal from Dr. Turek. Face me, you meddling moron. In fairness to Christopher, uh, that statement obviously was his opening statement, was not meant to rebut my statement, but now my statement is to rebut his. And I want to point out that most of what Christopher just said there is pretty much complaints about religion and religious people and has no impact on whether or not God exists. Religious people can be the worst people that ever lived. That says nothing about whether or not God exists. Uh, people can do evil. That doesn't mean the parents don't exist. Children can do evil. Doesn't mean the parents don't exist. My kids do evil, but I'm still here. I do evil. My dad's still here. In fact, he's sitting right there. What does that prove about whether or not God exists? Let me try and go down some of the things Christopher said. Yes, I am an atheist when it comes to Zeus, but Zeus is not spaceless, timeless, immaterial, powerful, moral, personal, intelligent creator that I hopefully, at least I thought I gave evidence for, and maybe Christopher will come back to my statements on that later. Uh, I don't believe in Zeus because I don't think there's any evidence for Zeus, but I think there's evidence for the theistic God. Uh, deism, I didn't make the uh, direct shift to theism. I probably should have been more explicit. I think it's obvious there's a theistic God because life came several billion years after the creation. That is not a deistic concept, that is a theistic concept. I didn't say anything about Christianity. Even though I am a Christian, I don't have time to defend Christianity here. I'd love to debate Christopher on the issue of Christianity in the future, and I'll publicly offer that right now. If he wants to debate whether or not the New Testament documents are reliable and tell us really what happened about what uh, Jesus uh, came and said and did, I'd be happy to do it. But when I mentioned before, I have a couple arguments in, uh, on the bench. I've got almost a full baseball team of arguments here. I've got a couple arguments on the bench. It's the resurrection is one of them. And I don't have time to, 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 to get to that here. So I'm not backing up the Christian God here. I'm backing up a theistic God, even though personally I do believe in a Christian God. Um, he claimed Darwin was the great emancipator 
and that um, he went on to talk about uh, atrocities. Uh, and I think he again missed my point. As I said before, I'm not saying atheists can't be moral. Christopher, what he says in his book again, much of it is true. Religious people have done awful things. In fact, Christianity predicts we'll be hypocrites. That's what the church is. It's full of hypocrites. Whenever somebody says, I don't want to go to church, there's too many hypocrites down there, I always say, come on down, pal, we got room for one more. That's what the church is. We're all fallen, we're all sinners, that's why we need a savior because we can't do it. And Christopher said, well, how can you command somebody to be well when they have no capacity to be well? Well, we were well in the beginning, and I'm going into Christian theology here, I understand. I'll just try and answer the point. We were well in the beginning, but then we messed up, and so God, the great physician, came back to save us. That's Christian theology. As again, I don't have time to support it. I'm just pointing out that is the theology. Now, Christopher talked about atrocities, but again, on the atheistic worldview, here's the main point. How do you define what an atrocity is? Who defines it? Who has the authority to define what an atrocity is? The carbon atom? The benzene molecule? I'm not saying you have to believe in God to be moral. I'm not saying that only religious people are moral. I'm not saying atheists can't be moral. I'm not saying atheists don't know morality. I'm saying there's no way to justify what is right and what is wrong unless there's some authority that provides it. What is the authority? In a materialistic worldview, there is no authority. The carbon atom has no moral authority over you. And it seems that Christopher goes on and on about how he does not want to be under any some, some kind of divine totalitarianism. That is a moral rejection of God. Where does he come up with this immoral totalitarianism? His worldview does not afford immorality because his worldview does not afford morality. He has to borrow from the Christian worldview in order to argue against it. In fact, he has to sit in God's lap to slap his face. Where does he get morality from? Where does he get reason from? Where does he get mathematics from? Where does he get consciousness from? Where does the universe, he said, there are explanations for where the universe came from. Atheistic, I'd love to hear them. I haven't heard one yet. How does something come from nothing with extreme fine-tuning? What is the explanation for that? He said there are arguments for the beginning of life that are naturalistic, not according to the people who are studying the matter. How about Francis Crick? If I can find his quote here. Francis Crick said, every time I write a paper on the origin of life, I swear I'll never write another one because there's too much speculation running after too few facts. Mark Kirshner of Harvard and John C. Gerhardt of Berkeley said everything about evolution before the bacteria-like life forms is sheer conjecture. Biochemist Klaus Dose admits that after more than 30 years of research into the origin of life has led to, quote, a better perception of the immensity of the problem of the origin of life on Earth rather than its solution. At present, all discussions on the principal theories and experiments in the field either end in stalemate or in conf a confession of ignorance. Now, I'm not saying that this is a default position, that m it must be God. I'm not saying that I just lack a natural explanation for the origin of life. I'm saying that specified complexity, information, the DNA structure that we all have is evidence for an intelligent being. Because information only comes from minds. The laws of ink and paper did not create, is, uh, God is not great. There was a mind behind it that brought it into existence. And there's a mind behind DNA. What is the atheistic explanation for DNA? What is the atheistic explanation for information? What is the atheistic or explanation for all of these nine things I mentioned? What time do I, have? I have none. Survey said, sit down. Yes, sir. Well, I think I, I'll just invite uh, Dr. Troy to do the following and make available to us in, on a sheet of paper, which I'm sure he has, the thesaurus of quotations that he's found from this and that scientist and physicist and natural scientist and so forth. And you will find when you read them, when you look at them, I was writing them down as you went through them, all of these are statements of uncertainty, all of them. They're statements of all we know is how little we know. 
That's been for many years my definition of an educated person, someone who knows enough to know how ignorant they are. Uh, it actually is the only, it's not my own original definition, it comes from the Greek, but uh, it's the only definition that works. And no one working, uh, toiling in the field of uh, science uh, could possibly say anything less or more of themselves, especially at a time like this. But there you have it right away. The theistic and the deistic explanation has to be based on a certainty that there is a supervising and, if you want to be a theist, a caring and intervening creator who manages these matters. And it has been a single sentence so far from Dr. Torek uh, in the support of that uh, proposition. Um, let me give you an example. Um, if you do the event horizon of uh, Stephen Hawking that I just mentioned, um, I'll take a cosmological one to begin with. The event horizon is the lip of the black hole. It's, it's the... Suppose you could travel towards a black hole and see it, and see the lip of it, and notice it before you went in and over that. That's what's known as the event horizon. Hawking had a gravely ill colleague in Cambridge who said if he knew he was definitely going to die, that's the way he'd like to go, be falling into the event horizon lip of the black hole, because in theory you'd be able to see the past and the future and time, except you wouldn't have quite enough time to do so. But there would be a grand way to check out if you were a physicist. Um, turn away from this, says the, th turn away from that. These incredible, majestic, awe-inspiring thoughts say that this. Think about the burning book instead. Think about the trivial miracles witnessed by sheep herding uh, peasants in Bronze Age Palestine. And think about the debt that they, they feel that we should incur for their sins. It was stated by Dr. Jordan that the sins of these people, the transgressions of these people, and the debt they owe their creator bind all of us as sinners. What a shame we're not perfect. What a shame there's nothing we can do about it. What a shame we're created already in prison and have to earn our emancipation. I tell you again, this is servility to the ultimate power. Now, there are, we, there are people in this audience much better equipped than I to say that there is so far nothing in our natural world to move away from the cosmological. There is nothing in our natural world, the globe we live on, that cannot be explained by random mutation combined with evolution by natural selection. Care to dance with death? Nothing works without that assumption. Everything works with it. There are lots of things that remain to be decided. But it's not a theory, or not just one. It does work, it is operational, it doesn't require a prime mover. Occam's razor says we should dispose of unnecessary, needless assumptions. That's what I propose we do in this case. I'll put it another way. How long would you say Homo sapiens has been on the planet? Um, Fra uh, Francis, um, not Crick, um, excuse me, the author of the Supervisor of the Human Genome Project, Collins, but my new best friend and uh, occasional debating enemy thinks, well, not more than half a million years. Richard Dawkins thinks it could be as much as three quarters of a million. I, I, I can sink the number, actually, if you like. We know that the, if we left, the species left Africa about 75,000 years ago having probably shrunk down to about two or 3,000 people as a result of a terrible climatic disturbance, probably from Indonesia, probably from a predecessor of Plankton, which meant that we were this close to joining the 99.8% of all species ever living on the surface of this planet who became extinct. Some design, by the way, profuse creation of millions and millions and millions of life forms all to be wiped out with not even anyone left to testify to their previous existence. We nearly joined that lot. Managed to get out of it just in time. Let's call it, I don't want Francis's um, um, million or um, half a million or Richard Dawkins or 75,000, whichever way around. Just give, me some, uh, just give me that amount of time. Suppose we've only been around for 75,000 years. Monotheism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, shows up, what, four or 5,000 years ago at the most. 
So if you give me my most microscopically small assumption of human existence, for at least 70,000 years, heaven watches as the human species is born, dies, usually of its teeth, usually at about 20, usually with infants having about a 9, 10, 2 percent chance. You can, I don't have to draw you. Watch as this with indifference. Thousands and thousands of generations, miserable, illiterate, starving, hungry. Uh, to say nothing of the wars they'll fight with each other. To say nothing of the cruelties they will inflict, as well as the ones they will suffer just from existence. And only uh, three or four, perhaps 5,000 years ago, heaven decides this is enough of that. It's time for an intervention. And the best way to do it would be in the most primitive part of the Middle East. Not in China, where people can read and, and have, have looked at telescopes. No, in the most primitive part of the Middle East, basically by offering human sacrifice to them. This is a doctrine that cannot be believed by anyone who studies anything scientific, anything historical, anything archaeological, anything paleological, anything biological. Not, can't be believed by anyone. Can't be only believed by someone who wants to be a plaything and a slave of a pitiless totalitarian power. How glad we should be that the evidence for this ghastly entity is nil. Good. Thanks. I'm going to stay out of the way and let them <laughs> ask questions of each other. And um, the way that we've scheduled is a minute to ask and five to answer. And we'll try to stay to that. So That's very generous. If you, Dr. Turk, would like to go first, since you had already posed some questions to Mr. Hitchens. How we'll many times there. do we do that? Three times. So you get three apiece. Wouldn't, could I just propose, unless you ha really have three that you're dying to. I, I don't have three I'm trying to die. But that seems a long time for the audience to have to go. Could we do it two, maybe, and get to their questions? I have six. <laughs> I'm, your, I'm your witness, then. <laughs> so three was right. Dr. Turek. OK. Christopher, uh, what is your explanation for the beginning of time, space, and matter out of nothing? Well, um, we don't know. I remember being asked by one of my children once when I said, well, what, what was there at the Big Bang? And I said, well, you have to imagine, this, is, this shows how poverty-stricken our own vocabulary is, and I suspect how poverty-stricken our own capacity is. In other words, I think there are some things, not that we don't understand or know, but that we cannot. So we're reduced to sort of primitive images. But I said, suppose you could picture all of matter, the whole of matter, condensed into, I, I got this from Hawking, I think, one of his colleagues, condensed into something like a very small, dense, black suitcase of the kind you see people carrying money in in crime for. And it's about to fly over. That's what you'd have to be able, and that everything that's ever going to be is inside that. Uh, that was the best I could do. And I don't think many people could do if I say it myself, that much better. But I was completely unhorsed because the kids said, well, what was outside the suitcase? And I thought, oh, well, I can't, I, I can't do that. And I don't know anyone who can. And that, in a way, would be my whole point. I don't have to know. You do. You're the one who says you know, but not me. The theist and the deist say, oh, come on, we know. This is only possible with an author. It's only possible with a creator. It's only possible with a master and commander. It's only possible with a dictator. You're welcome. I don't need five minutes. Is it, is it fair to say, though, that uh, if the creation was out of nothing, and that's the common view today, that the being that brought it into existence, the cause, whatever it was, don't say being. What, what be, ground do you have to say being? Uh, because to go from a state of non-existence to a state of existence, you need to make a choice. No, you don't. You don't. How, do, how, how does something that... Where are you getting this choice from? The choice, how does a... Um, first of all, there was no nature, there was nothing. So if there was nothing, how do you get something from nothing without a cause? How do you get... I can ask the same question the way I did before. How do you get so much 
nothing from something. You look into the night sky, if you're in, say, the Carmel Peninsula, you can't do it from many parts of Virginia now, but if you are in certain parts of California, as I was recently, you can look on, into the night sky and see universes blowing up and bursting into flame every night of the week, several times. Uh, they had something, and it's all nothing now. Uh, who's the author of that? Who mandated that? Who's the creator of that? Who's the dictator who demands that sacrifice? The fact that You're making a rod for your own back here. No, the, the fact that things go out of existence, Christopher, doesn't mean that they're not designed. The typewriter is out of existence right now, actually. But the typewriter's designed. So the fact that the universe is going to be dead doesn't mean that it didn't have a designer at the beginning. And of course, religious people believe that somebody's going to intervene to stop it before it does go. And even if oh, they do, even if it doesn't, wait, 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 even, wait. If no, hold on. Sorry. even if nobody intervenes, do, do, if it goes to heat death, excuse me, 